That was really heartwarming and flattering. I wanted to say that Liz actually knew what to do with me, which is a very, very big step up. Because oftentimes when you say to someone, I'm a project manager, nobody actually knows what to do with that. Say, you know, think, what do you guys actually do? So hang on while I set up. I got a frog on my screen, but anyway. So um, let's start. Before I begin, there is a quick announcement because, you know, they were in Google. We have to show off a little bit. Our book's coming out today. Check that out. It's in the afternoon after the, um, uh, the Who, What is SRE panel. Um, I think there are a handful of free copies available for today. Sign. Oh, I see. Whatever Liz says. So, <laughs> so do that. Anyway, let's get going from there. Brief introduction first. Um, my name is Kripa, and I've been at Google the last 10 years. I'm uh, shocking, <laughs> I know. Um, the, I, uh, I've moved around a lot at Google, but the organization I have stayed with the longest in my time at Google has been SRE. Um, and I, I moved around from dev teams in, within SRE teams. Today, I run the BreakFix team. I probably have one of the best jobs at Google because I actually get paid to break stuff. So, you know, very carefully. Um, the BreakFix team is all about incident response. We do a lot of you know, making sure that we don't, our fires are not bigger than they need to be, that we know how to respond to them in a timely fashion, that we actually cause these fires in some manner every now and then. Um, our team is responsible for studying postmortems from various outages that we have, finding thematic problems that we can you know, solve holistically, things like that. I also run um, the Cloud Product Operations Group along with Cloud Reliability, but that's a different thing, not relevant to this conversation, but yes, I work there as well. Um, Prior to this, I had a, I mean, I did a lot of random things, but my background has been in the arts. It was in theater and music. I know some of you asked questions about that earlier today. Um, I was not a great musician, and I was certainly not a good actress. What I lacked in skill, I made up for in sheer enthusiasm. But I was very good at pulling things together, and that's sort of what has become the, the cornerstone of my career at Google. Um, so what's this talk actually about? Well, it's easier for me to start with what it's not about. So let me get all the disclaimers out of the way first. I am not an organizational theorist. I am not an organizational behaviorist. I have never read a book on teams. In fact, I've barely read a book on management. So I actually am not qualified to give you this talk. But, <laughs> but what I do have is the following. Um, I've been in more projects than you can count at Google, ranging from projects that add three people to things that involve moving a lot of people in the company. And because the company had been in a state of hyper growth for so long, you get to learn a lot in an extremely time compressed manner. So you just have lesson after lesson after lesson. And Google also has the culture, like the postmortem culture, as you say, you fail fast, you learn quick, and you move on. So there, there were a lot of postmortems in the time that I have been in teams. So it's a collection of these experiences that I'm bringing over here. So most of my talk is really a bunch of stories. And I have some inferences that I make, but a lot of people take away what they like to from stories. So I let you guys take whatever you'd like to from the stories I've got today as well. Um, oh, of course, a lot of this is based on patterns that are repeating. So these are not just arbitrary story and one-off things. A lot of the, the, thing, the stories I give you today are representative of things that I've seen over and over again in the company. So patterns are more important than anything else. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, I wanted a quick show of hands to just get a sense of the demographic of the group here. How many of you work in teams of, say, 1 to 10? The bulk of you, all right. How many of you work in teams of 10 to, say, 50? And anyone over 50? All right, OK. Well, I'm going to we'll cover the range of them in a second. Um, so we're all introduced to teams very early on in our lives, right? Like my earliest memory goes, I know there's like, this is not like a long saga story, I promise you. But my first story actually begins at kindergarten, first grade, and I don't remember. And it was all about the terrifying potato. This is what this is all about. So when we were kids, I don't remember how old we were, we were all bunched up. There was this thing called Sports Day. And all our kids were you know, divided up into groups of four. And the task at hand was each kid would go and do something and come back to the starting point and then relay tag the next kid who would go do the second task, the third kid does a third. And at the end, the team that finishes all of this quickly would be the winners. So in my case, I was the first kid that was competing in this thing for the first task. And it had to do with a potato race. And the job was, you run, you pick up a potato, bring it back to the beginning. Run, pick up the second potato, bring it back to the beginning. You pick up the third potato and come back to the beginning. Now, all of this is fantastic. I've got the rules, I've got a strategy, everything is great. Except the kid next to me, who is competing in the same race as me, does the following stint. So I get to my second potato, and it's simply not there. And I'm just stumped. So I sit there, 
and my team members are yelling at me, go pick up his potato, but he's got his too. So I didn't know what to do, right? So I'm standing there, everybody's yelling at me, and I promise you that was the day I decided teams were crap. And then I also, did, I also decided, I mean, I was also the kid that forever, from that point onward, for the rest of my life, always had a headache or a stomach ache or was sick during gym class or physical ed or whatever. I just refused it. It's not my thing. Anyway, so I passed the potato. But then we eventually, you know, you'll get to, like, you know, college. And in college, this is even worse, right? Because in college, the first day of class, the professors will say something like, all of you form your teams. I mean, it is the most awkward moment in college when you don't know anybody that's around you and you're all trying to shove yourselves into this team structure and then you're really worried, what if no one picks me sort of thing, right? This is terrible. But then the thing about college is because you don't know each other well enough at the time, you just, everybody's fungible because nobody actually knows what roles are missing in the team. So all of you just show up. And usually the count composition is like this. There's one person who probably never show up to class. There's one that would never do any work. There's one that's the overachiever that gets everything done. And it doesn't matter whether anybody else pulls their weight or not. It's that score that everybody's going to get. So there's actually no incentive to do work. So, um, and then the rest of them are really angry that they don't know what's going on. It's roughly, right? So, so, so that's at least my college experience. So you know, I was usually the flustered kid. But, um, but what I'm getting at is that in both these situations, in both in the kindergarten ex ex situation and in college situations, the, prob the thing over here is they go with a very fungible manner. You can swap any two people out and it wouldn't make a difference because you wouldn't know what's different. You, you, nobody would actually, you don't have enough time to know what's different. Except if you really have an athletic kid who could run faster than the other kid to pick up the right potato. But other than that. So eventually, I played in a music band. Now, you can't afford to have everybody play guitars in that music band unless you're all so exceptionally amazing, which doesn't happen all the time. So if you find five people playing the guitar, you probably want to pick up the bass, right? You <laughs> might want a different thing. But what I'm basically saying is every component of a music band, from the band manager to every instrumentalist to the singers, you have a place. You got to do certain things in a controlled manner. You can't just be like, I'm going to play my song while you play your song, which all actually did happen in our band. We played two different Led Zeppelin songs, and we didn't even know until the middle of the, 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 <laughs> the tune was going on. So <laughs> anyway, it was at the lead, the bassist and the lead guitarist were just doing their own thing anyway. But, it just sounds like noise if you don't get this right. And sort of something, this is a very good symbol for what a good team would look like. If you had a really good band, people kind of know when you're performing what pieces you're supposed to be at. And so that's my symbol for a band because, you know, I'm not a very good slide maker. So that's what you got. Um, so, so how did all of this really help me in tech? Well, it did not one bit. It's all in hindsight. I'm looking at this and I'm looking at, hey, these are the things I already learned. I could have used these lessons. And I actually didn't until way later. But I'll get to this in a little bit more detail in one second. So let's talk about how roles evolve in a company. So here I have to go into interviews. So sorry, Google. I've got to start with that. So day one, um, I go to Google actually after a lot of fighting because I really didn't want to interview in a company and be rejected by them. Like, that was just not a thing I wanted to do. So I go to this interview, and the first interviewer asked me a question about, hey, what is it that you want to do if you had this job at Google? And I basically said, I want to travel the world. And then he asks, what paid job do you want to do at Google? <laughs> and then, and then I'm, oh, OK. So you know, we finished that interview. Then the second one came about. This was an engineering interview. And you know, we went about, there was a bunch of questions they were asking. And somewhere in about like, the middle of the interview, um, uh, the engineer then asks me, hey, what do you actually want to do? And I basically said, look, I'm done coding. I don't want to do this anymore. I've been an SA. I've been, like, I've written code. I, I do something else. Like, put me somewhere else. And he continued the question train. He asked me a couple more things. And then he bolted out the room. And, and you could hear what was going on outside the room because he went to his tech lead or his manager. I don't remember. Um, and the conversation was, I don't know what questions to ask her. What does this person do if you don't write code? What is the, does she actually have a place in the company? And I'm all, OK, this interview is really not going the way I expected it to. <laughs> so, so you know, I was being honest. So um, anyway, we came back. It all worked out, I guess. Eventually, I joined Google. It didn't end there, right? Because you know, this, this project management thing, or technical program manager, project management, program management, I use them all interchangeably. So just a role that's not purely writing code that helps glue things together is what we do. Um, so eventually, I joined the company. So within the first couple of days, I was introduced to my group as the Associate Technical Program Coordinator. I have no idea what that means. But then, here I am, I'm that person. And my boss at the time explains my job to me. And this is how he explained it. You have a pile of sand on the floor. Your job is to scoop it all up. And then all the engineers will run all over it. And then you scoop it all up again. Come on. <laughs> that, that was thoroughly inspiring, I have to say. <laughs> So inspiring. 
So, and then the next day, my, my tech lead has a sit down with me. Like this is a team of 40 people. This is not a small engineering team. The 40 people, all of them just running in complete chaos. We were in crazy growth phase, lots of nooblers. We didn't know what to do, right? So tech lead comes to me and says, your job is to do what the tech leads tell you to do and not what the managers tell you to do. Well, okay, this is going to be great. This is like already setting the stage for success. But, but what's interesting about this is that they actually didn't know what to give me to do which is sort of why they're making all these metaphorical things. And I'm like an entry level God knows what. And I, I, I really genuinely didn't know how to translate that to anything useful. But here's what I actually did. There are 40 people running headless, right? And nobody knows what's going on. Every time I talk to someone, they send me to four other people to talk to to get an answer for something. So the thing I did was something very, very basic. I made a list. I went around to everybody and I did an inventory of what 40 people were working on. It's not a big thing. It was just like I created a list. But what I didn't realize until after I'd done that is what a powerful construct a list was. And um, because for a change, now people actually knew what problems to really solve. You could tell, for example, there were like 10 of these 40 people that are working on very similar projects and never sat together. They didn't even know they were on the same set of projects. You make them sit together. You then realize they don't talk to each other, so they predict all these schedules that were made up in space. And then you say, maybe we should talk every day, do a stand up every morning. And then you, I mean, like very, very tiny things. These are very simple solutions for something that's completely overwhelming. Is that project management? I don't know. Anybody else could have done it. Like a tech lead could have done it. A manager could have done it. I mean, it's not a specialized skill. It's a, someone had to play that role. And that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what title that person came with. It just matters someone played that role. So it was pretty phenomenal. So now people began to understand that I could clean up stuff. That, that's how far I got in my career, right? So, so I could clean up stuff. So they now invited me to this awesome project. And this is how they described the project to me, right? Hey, we've got this. I cannot obviously tell you guys exactly what it was. But at the time, it involved working with a lot of financial institutions across the world. And um, it involved like, you know, places like really exotic trips to Argentina and Brazil and India, whatever. Like, it was like, OK, I want that job, obviously. It's like, we need your help to bring structure to this project. Well, I want to do that job you know, because I heard the word travel and I was all in. But then. Um, Here's the mistake I made. I didn't ask about what my role really was in that project, right? Because I was not the person on the planes going anywhere. I was the one that went week to week to week to this meeting with all of these financial institutions and with a giant spreadsheet of 50 projects and then asked them, what is the status of each thing? Check. What is the status of this thing? Check. And I did this over and over again. So for a while, the question was, well, why is this the job I'm doing? Actually, the question was, why is this even a job? I mean, <laughs> a lot of institutions move way slower, right? I mean, if you're really, depending on the country you come from, five weeks later, you might have moved your, your target by you know, a day. Well, hmm, this is not really the thing that's working for me. But, but what I'm getting at over here is, people don't really think about what roles they want on their teams. We sometimes hire to just do something and figure it out, but really, they may not be space. So realistically speaking, in, like, especially in tech, you're allowed to fill the gaps that exist. So in this case, I could have been the person that said, OK, I'm going to go negotiate with these banks. I mean, I'm an entry level person. There's no chance they're going to let me do that. But then, um, or I could be the person, like, I could have expanded my role, except there were a lot of people doing the roles I could see already. So I did not have enough space. So the question to ask is, whether you should actually be bringing in someone to do the job, or whether it just takes three weeks of someone's dedicated time to put up that structure and then just turn the crank, right? It, you may not even need a person for this job. So just, just a thought. Um, similar patterns. I said all of these are about patterns. I did the same thing. I, at some point, I joined SRE. And the first team I was on in SRE, actually, not the first, eventually. There's like somewhere in the middle. Um, Oh, when I was with Liz, they had fires all the time. So that was not, that was not the problem. But there, was, there was a team where there were four engineers, and there was me and a manager. Now, if you're four engineers, do you need a project manager and a manager? You probably don't need both, technically. But if you're a four engineer team, and you're all really good, you basically get your job done most of the time. And the only thing that you needed help with is for someone to point every now and then to say, hey, you kind of need to finish that thing that you started. That's about it. That's about the job total. So you know. Every, every, my job then became, so within the first three weeks of being on the team, I'd already set up everything that they needed, like a bugs process, a triage process, whatever you needed. But what was great was if after that, I would come to work in the morning saying, OK, um, there's this task that a you know, person, Dan, need to get, needs to get done. 
but he just finds it really boring and probably will never do it. So I would write a sticky note saying, Dan, please do this today, and post it on his monitor. So two hours in a day, I whiled away, and then I have six more to go. I didn't know what to do with my time. So you know, <laughs> very, very interesting start. Um, but basically, I'm saying, think about it very carefully when you're trying to put people in a team role. And you know, if you do the right things, then the right things happen really, really well. So pattern one. Um, of course, a lot of people know me more for the work I did in disaster recovery testing at Google. And the reason I bring this up is because it's easy for me to actually openly talk about it and actually say what I did in it because it's a public project. So that's why it's over here. It's not because I'm actually talking about this. So the disaster recovery project at Google basically is us being able to break everything possible at Google, which is a very complex thing to do because you have to go to like 50 teams, or actually it's hundreds of teams at this point, that go and break stuff. And you need to make sure that the thing that one person breaks does not break someone else. And then you also need to create tests of your own. For example, if you take down an entire data center facility, you're breaking everybody at once. And it cannot be at the same time. They're all trying to break their own things also. It's like you have to re there's a lot of magic that goes into a technical design and coordination that goes into a project of this size. So let's actually talk to the evolution of this, right? And here I've actually got the flip side. It's my role and where I needed the TL. This is not about the engineers needing a TPM. It's the other way around, right? Um, so my job was very central. I was the middle circle. There's a bunch of teams in the early days of DIRT. There are like 10 teams that are interested in running disaster recovery tests. All I had to do was walk to them and say, have you written your tests? I don't like your test. This is a stupid test, and we'll have an argument, and then the right tests will come out. That's about it. That was the total sum total of what we did for DIRT for the first time. And then we went and talked to our VP, saying, OK, look, you're not going to learn anything by doing this. You actually have to break something. So we said, can we take down something, like our source control or something like that? And he said, yes. But now I didn't. I was way over. You know, I couldn't do it on my own. There was no chance because I decided I'm not going to write code, right? So at that point is when I realized it's not just that. What if I'm planning to take down a data center A, and here's the ads organization saying I'm going to fail over all these critical systems from data center B into A at the same time? This will be a complete disaster. We will explicitly cause an outage, which is the whole, you know, the counterpoint of the exercise. So. Um, so I, at that point, went and said, I need to partner with someone who can do the things I cannot. And I found myself someone who was phenomenally good at being a tech lead, right? So, and that was probably the best decision I've made. And I keep making that decision over and over again in my career, which is I partner with someone who does the things I don't do well. It doesn't matter if it's technical or not. I'm not a very organized and structured person. So I partner with people who are extremely structured and organized people. Because together, we actually accomplish a lot more than I could on my own. But so here. There's the two of us. But the beauty about this is it wasn't like, it wasn't, the way this was organized was not like, if you have technical questions, go to this person. If you have project management questions, come to me. It was, you have questions, come to the two of us. That was it. There was two people. We ran the show. It was a partnership. It wasn't someone's the lead, someone's not the lead, and stuff like that. It was actually a very, very beautiful, I, I would look at that as one of the best run projects I've ever had in my time at Google, just from that partnership. Um, and I, the pattern repeats, of course. So partnering second pattern that we found, continuing on to DIRT. So we found that this was not enough. Over a period of time, once the teams learned that we were willing to push things further and break things more, they also wanted to break things more. Now, we were both in over our heads because we didn't know what any of these specific systems did. So Gmail would say, I kind of want to take down that set of mail servers, and all of these people want to have email access. I'm all of is that OK to do for the business? Who would I even ask? Well, how would you do that technically? Which other services are you going to break? And we were not the right people to answer that question. We were generalists. We could swap between, we could swap between teams and do the right thing. So what we had over here was now we had to create little specializations within each of the teams. So it's not like I hired three people per team to do the job. It could be the same human being doing everything. But the roles we're looking for are someone who's a subject matter expert, can make decisions on behalf of Gmail. We need someone who's a technical expert who can tell whether how to make the test, roll it back carefully. If you cause an outage, who we need to, who, what your Rolodex look like, like, that's that person. And we need a person who's actually going to track all the tests we're really doing. So basically, I've created a structure already. It doesn't matter whether it's one person, it's a TPM or a TL, or it, the titles don't matter. It matters that a person or some human being collection can actually do that thing, right? So we expanded it. This is sort of how the project evolved. Now what's the problem? What have we just done? Problem is, we have way more gluing work to do because we didn't anticipate this to be the size of the project. So the two of us in the middle could no longer sustain this because all we were doing was trying to figure out escalations. That's all we did. 80% of our job was escalations and just keeping some stuff together. So the middle team also had to grow. So we actually had to boost up a bunch of people, but very different roles. Some of them were going to be coordinators. They were just, just to glue things together. Some of them were going to make sure that all the big test designs were, had gone through like the right amount of rigor. It's, there's just a lot of stuff over here. So what I'm basically getting at is 
that every team structure, and this you can, for a team, you can look at your immediate team, you can look at your overall organization, it doesn't matter, right? Every team structure, think carefully about what actually goes into it. You need some generalists, you need some specialists. If you're in a tiny team of two, you probably need two engineers, you probably need nothing more than that. And when I say engineers, I mean the, whatever variety of engineer there is. If you're a test engineer, an SRE, a suite, it doesn't matter, right? It's like engineers. If you are like maybe 10 people, you probably need someone who's going to play the role of, okay, look, the whole team should be cohesive and work on something that's useful. So you might want a manager role at that point. If you're interfacing with multiple other roles, you might want a TPM. And when I say t these are roles, these are not humans. So it could be the same. Like a tech, tech lead sometimes play these hybrid roles or um, actually SREs on average play a lot of these roles. Um, if you're larger, you just might want to give someone more dedicated time to do the job right. So, so, that, so just think about this a little bit more. If your team is in hyper growth, then you might want a tech writer in there to actually help with documentation so you don't have to spend all your time trying to train up people with the same information over and over again. You, if you are trying to produce a dashboard that pe your customers can look at to see if you have an outage or not. Actually, let's go back to a story there. When I first joined the SRE team and I asked people, how do people tell if your service is out? The SREs pointed me to a dashboard and a beautiful dashboard it was. It had columns of numbers. There were no labels. There were just columns of numbers. And then there was a graph. And it could have been a static drawing from somewhere. It wouldn't matter. And say, the graph dips. That's how you know it's an outage. There's no x-axis, y-axis. There's like, the log table. I didn't know how to read anything that was going on. Sometimes a UX designer is not a bad idea to have on the team. Is sort of the point I was making. So, so anyway, so go on from there. But um, all right, so I have one more question to ask. How many of you in this room are leads of something? Tech lead, manager of leads, et cetera, anything? Like a good 60, 70, 60% maybe of the group over here? All right, um, and how many of you try to change your titles in the room? I'll give you an example. I am the, like the ninja knife fighter. I am the cat herder. I mean, anything. If you feel like actively try to change your real title, how many of you try to do that? It's very small. You guys are a shy bunch then. All right, we'll leave that as is. So, um, so the reason I bring this up is, I'll actually come to this example in a second. This is my favorite drawing. I've reused it like 20 times in the slide deck. But um, the problem is titles matter, right? In one, either recognition of the title, or people sometimes want to be known by the title. Hey, I'm the VP of X and Y. I want to be, I'm the Uber TL. I'm the principal TL. People like being known by the titles. Sometimes people don't like it, and they want to be known for not liking titles. So I'm Ninja, right? So you, you, titles matter, and they're valued in different ways. Here's the, here's the problem with that, which is that once you give someone a title, people solve for that title. So because you became a lead, Generally, you become a lead because you're already doing the job. But if you become a lead, it doesn't make it any more important. I mean, you don't have to become leaderly because you became a lead, right? So let me explain this a little bit. So there was this time when I was asked to work on a project. Let's call this project Fluffy. I hope this is the example I'm going with. Well, anyway. So, um, so we've got this project Fluffy. And let's say it has to do with something to do with changing everything in SRE organization. And for example, let's say we want to overhaul our monitoring infrastructure or combine all the monitoring that we do into something that's robust and centralized and everybody like whatever. So what's the first problem that you see? I'm pretty sure you all see this already. <laughs> but the number of people interested in solving this problem goes through the roof, right? Because every team in SRE is, cares about monitoring. Every team cares about alerting. Every team cares about how much work it's going to cost them to change to whatever this new infrastructure is. So there's a line of people that are all interested in being part of this team. And usually, they come with certain titles. So for Project Fluffy, given this is the kind of landscape, I was asked to go and hang out in this room and say, Kripa, go lead this, figure out what's going on, and bring some, some sanity to Project Fluffy. So I go into the room, and this is what happens. Every person in the room sort of introduced themselves in the first few minutes. Person, person A says, I'm person A, I'm a lead on Project Fluffy, and I represent storage's interests. Person B, I'm person B, I am Fluffy's lead, and I want to make sure that we don't go astray. Person three, I'm person three, I am a lead also on Fluffy, and I'm here to make sure that we do the right thing by monitoring design. Dozen people in the room, all dozen of them were leads. I mean, now who's actually doing any work? So I'm actually not sure how the structure played out. And this is a true story. I'm, I wish I was futzing around with this, but I'm really not. But the interesting thing is not that they were not, like they were all leads in their own right, absolutely, for their areas of order they were. But 
Now that I have a joint structure, I cannot afford to have a dozen leads because then I actually have no work. I mean, there's no project. None of the leads had a charter. None of the leads knew what exactly we were executing. None of the, they all had ideas about how we should do the thing we want to do, but what is it that we're actually doing? It was actually a very hard problem to solve. So the first step was to fire people from the project. But, I'm, but actually, that's incorrect. It's not firing them from the project. It's firing them from the roles that they're, they think they're playing on the project. And you find that they become so much easier to solve once you just remove them from playing the part of lead of whatever, right? You say, hey, you two, you've, known, you've been running the monitoring team for a long time. You should be involved in the core design of whatever it is that we're doing next. You four, you guys run like giant, your directors, you have like these huge teams. Your job is to be stakeholders. We will tell you what you're doing. And you can have commentary and you can review the work you're doing, but you don't actually have to be the lead in every piece that we're doing of this project. You three, you are the actual SREs over here. You should be part of the team that's actually building the stuff that we're trying to build. Like, for example, right? And you'll find very quickly that people just self-organize into the groups that have common missions and they just go away and you don't have that kind of chaos anymore. So simple, simple fixes. It's simple in terms of theory, but when you actually get down to it and try to pull people out, it actually takes a lot longer than you'd imagine. But, um, but, the, but what I'm getting at is that the, the title sort of skews what people believe they're likely to do. A title is meaningless if people don't have an actual role and a responsibility. So that's actually super critical to get right on a team. Um, the famous philosopher, his name is Gregory House. So, so, so there was a episode, the, the, the TV show House, for those of you who weren't watching this. There was this episode, and he's a really great diagnostic specialist, whatever. So this doctor has a, you know, he's trying to run a competition between a bunch of people who he wants to elect onto his staff, like he wants a team of doctors. So there's one dude who shows up, and he has not... He's not a doctor, but he knows more than most of the doctors in the room, so he totally gets everything. And then he tells Gregory House, dude, I want to be on your team. Are you going to hire me? And Gregory says, well, you can kind of get me coffee and such, but because you're really good, I will come to you to consult for medical opinions. And then he said, what, you mean like be your assistant? That's not really my dream job. And then Gregory House says, well, that is your dream job. It's just not your dream title. So I'm saying, true statement, yeah? So, <laughs> so but he could have done everything, but basically people care about it a lot. So I'm saying, care about it, that's fine, but also ignore it when it actually comes to what you need to get done in a team. Um, where are we? Now let me ask you, given this, how many of you are leads on your projects? Rhetorical question, you don't have to answer. I was kidding, I was kidding. So, um, all right. So basically, solve for roles and responsibilities and not just for titles. So. Actually, I would like to ask a different question over here. Show of hands, if any of you have been in situations where your roles were unclear and you're kind of like, you know, dancing around another person, you're be being very polite about, you know, not stepping on into their areas, or if you feel like, uh, I don't know, that you're in conflict but not really fighting, but you're not really collaborating to the fullest extent, any of this, raise your hands. Yeah, basically everybody, right? So, <laughs> so it's not a difficult fix. It's just a simple fix. And I, I'd say that, I'd say I, I harp on this a lot because people generally get, you could be a 10 time more productive team if your roles were slightly more clear, just slightly. And I would say that people often all flock to the, it's not just lead, it's any title, right? If people flock to the problems that look tractable. For example, if I said I'm fixing monitoring, everybody sees I can fix monitoring as the thing. They don't see the sub pieces that will actually fall from it. So when you have a team of that, you want to bring in the person that can actually see beyond what is tractable at that moment in time. You want to bring in the futurist, the person who can see opportunity beyond what you've got. Anyway, so it's like I'm off my pedestal for that one. Um, so where was I going? Oh, back to this again, because my favorite picture. So let's actually talk about another set of problems that we have. Um, so is it enough if you care about just the roles in the team? Do you care about anything else? Personalities, maybe styles of people. So here's another team, um, also pretty, all real true story. And the team almost looks exactly the same as Fluffy. Like all of them showed up, they're all leads. Okay, we've got that out of the way. Here's a second problem, which is very interesting for me. Every single person on that team was super competent, really, really good, outstanding. In fact, most of the time they talk, it's all, I have no idea what's going on, because they're, they're really, really amazingly smart, and I feel really stupid most of the time in front of them. But they all had the same style in that if you ask them, how is this effort doing, they will tell me in like 
this machine part fits into that machine part. Like nobody could actually tell me what was going on with the whole story. They all knew that they were extremely detailed in what they understood. They were extraordinarily technical. They knew the network of the pieces that fit together, but they couldn't zoom out and actually provide like a, here's a global view of actually what's going on. But, and, and so everybody was crowding the same spaces. So everybody's all complaining about, I'm, they're all working on the same project. They're all working on the same sets of things. So it was sort of an interesting situation. Here was the only single change that we made. I brought in one person into the team, one additional. I didn't remove anybody from the titles. I brought in one person into the team who was extraordinarily good at seeing a problem and presenting the problem in a way that many, many people could understand. This was very similar to my creating the list early on. Basically, it's the visualization of something actually solves the problem for you in a lot more ways than you can imagine. What do you think happened? Basically, everybody fell into place because they could all see the problem before they're all attacking the problem. So the moment they could, they actually self-organized into, hey, I can do these parts really well. I think this is better fit for that group. And so the SRE teams took one part of it, the dev teams took another part of it, the TPMs took another part of it. So it was actually beautiful. Tiny, tiny changes, you might actually make massive changes to the productivity of your team or your project. There's a lot of good things that would come out of it. Um, there are, like, there are, I actually want to talk about a few examples of this state, right? Like a lot of the changing the dynamics of a group. If you have a group that has an extraordinarily dominant personality, someone who represents the group all the time, just, just is the person that talks all the time, et cetera. And then you go and talk to their manager, for example, and say, hey, I would like to elect another person on the team to do something. And the manager says, well, no one else is up to snuff, right? This has happened. This happens quite a bit. You remove this dominant personality completely from the team. Just remove them. What do you think happens? Everybody else comes up to snuff very, very quickly. Everybody else will become the people that are willing to talk. They're no longer fearful of what happens. I'm not saying go and fire everybody on your team. That's not what I'm saying. I'm basically saying use this as input into what, you're, what the decisions that you would make within a team, right? Um, another example would be if you have a super positive person on your team and you have a super negative person on your team, one complains all the time, one's happy all the time, what do you think is going on? They will kill each other. This is absolutely going to happen. They will kill each other. The negative person says, I can't stand that person drives me up the wall. They're just smiling all the time. That's irritating. And then the positive person is, I don't understand why you sound like Eeyore every day. Like, it's, it's like a, so you know, it's like really, really horrible. So usually you pull one out, and the team balances itself off immediately. So when you have like stark opposites, you know, one thing to do is think about that. Um, I would say that if you have, if you have an introvert, on your team, or actually, let's go back. Let's have a quiet person on your team. It's not an introvert, a quiet person on your team, someone who doesn't automatically talk. Sometimes you would find that they actually have better ideas than most of the other talkers on your team. The problem is we're not very good at drawing them out to say something. We actually suck at that because we all get excited in the moment and the talkers talk, right? I'm one, I know. Um, and if you actually, so there's this um, leadership training I'd gone to a while ago. It was kind of interesting because there's this one guy who was the quietest person in that pack, and he was so good at solving everything, like he could see 100 steps forward. He was really good, but I was the talker. So he solved everything, and he used me as the microphone to go and say everything in the loud group because he was just not comfortable talking to people, right? And saying, for drawing out people, simple, simple changes will change the dynamics of your team very, very quickly. So I want to touch upon one more area over here, I think. Oh, let's come to that which is personalities. I love this part because everybody likes to put themselves in boxes saying, what personality do I actually fall into? So we're going to talk about personalities in a second. This matters a lot in your team composition. So, so far we've talked about the roles in your team, the partnering on your team, whether you want specialist roles versus the general roles. You talked about roles and responsibilities versus the title and the fact that you should probably ignore the title for the most part. Um, small changes for massive improvements or not in productivity, depending on what you do. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about personality traits and the different ways to skin this cat. So let's take two examples, and some of this I'm pretty sure you all know really, really well. The first one is, this is gone by many names, and so I'm not going because I don't know if I'm actually allowed to talk about this because it comes in like a closed forum. So I'm just going with random colors and random things. So let's say that there are four types of people in the universe, which is one of the, it's a very popular leadership training. They do to talk, to talk about this quite a bit. The first one is a red colored personality type. It's like you're always after the new shiny. Like, New ideas all the time. Every day is a new opinion, new thing. Just you want shiny, shiny, shiny. You will never finish your projects past like 70% close, and that's you. You have a second type of person who's a relationship builder. Well, if I don't do this right, will that person be upset at me? Will I offend this person if I do X and Y? It matters to them how well they relate to people. It's a second type of person. The third one is the thinker, the analytical kinds. You need a lot of data before you're comfortable making a decision. You have to internalize everything that you get before you make a decision. And the fourth one is a closer. 
You make lists of everything that you need to get done. You make sure they're scratched. You tie up all the loose ends, et cetera. It's the four very different types of people in a workforce, right? If you are dominant of one type, you can already see what would happen, correct? I'll give you a startling example, a great example of this. Project managers, by nature, tend to be closers. They tend to be the ones that close out like, the things that everybody else has left behind. This is usually the case. You tend to draw out lists. You have a plan. You, everybody executes towards the plan. We get it done. So there's this one time I took my team of project managers, and if you guys are here, I'm really sorry, but I took my team of project managers on an offsite to Vegas. And all we had to do, all we had to do was get from building A to building B. That was it. And it was a long walk, right? Vegas, the strip is really, really broad, really, really huge. And, and, that, and you have a team of project managers. What do you think is going on? We've got routes planned differently. We've got, like, everybody's all, though, if we leave at exactly this point in time, we will reach there and that point in time. By the time we could get to that place, oh, dear God, none of us went there together because it is cat herding the cat herders. And it is much harder than cat herding itself. So I'm just saying, it was a pretty big disaster, right? So, or teams that have a lot of new shiny people. All you do is have new ideas, and you actually don't get anywhere because you are bored after you're done exploring the early part of the idea. So partner with the people that don't quite do the same things as you do. And it actually goes a really long way. Um, I tend to be of the first line often, and so I partner very heavily with the people in the fourth line because otherwise, you know, I would fail desperately at my job. This is true. Um, I also know that after I started working in SRE that any blue that I had went down and all the green started going up again. So basically, it's like this, the colors change, so I've become a lot more of a thinker than a, look, I really care about people's feelings sort of thing, and it's all your fault. So <laughs> just saying, just getting it out of there. So... Um, no, I was just kidding. But let's actually talk about something that's more popular than this, things that you're more familiar with, right? Everybody's, oh, most of you, would have done a Myers-Briggs test at some point. So there was a very interesting thing. I'm not going into the details, and I can't even read. I, don't, I did this at 2 in the morning, so I don't remember what the slide said. But the, if you were to go and do your personality type, there was this team that I was part of, and it was a fantastic team, very, very intelligent people, really driven, extreme, extraordinary go-getters, and we could not move a single project to launch. Two years in, we're still struggling, and we don't understand why, right? So we actually had to get like someone, I mean, it sounds terrible, but it's true. We actually had to get someone external to like provide us with therapy, and it's not therapy, really, but counseling in some ways to figure out why we were such a dysfunctional team. It could not have had better people on the team. And then they realized that of the eight or nine people that were driving the direction for the team, the nine people, eight people belonged in the exact same square in that entire like 16 square set up, right? One square, eight people. And they were all the kinds who were not planners. They don't, have a, they don't care about a plan. Every morning, all of them came up with new ideas. Just shiny, shiny every day. We could be doing that. We could be doing the other thing. No one would commit to an actual decision because by the time you get to decision point, you've already changed your idea about what you want to do. Like Nothing happened. And there was this one person, one lone person, who belonged to a different box that involved actually doing work. Like, you know, let's take this idea and actually launch it. But this person was no match to the team of eight who would throw random ideas at this person every day. So that was a project destined to do. <laughs> and so we then removed a lot of people, and that's what happened. That one actually involved removing people because it was just such an imbalanced group. So, you know, like bring balance to the universe or whatever. You absolutely need to do this in every team setup. Um, there are several other things you would worry about over here. I'm not going to go into details. Like, you know, you have to have the same values to work with. So what, the, my summary over here is really people are extraordinarily multidimensional. Like, you cannot make a decision today and just assume it's going to work. You have to constantly tweak. And I would ask you guys to, depending on the teams that you're in, think about where you are and think about what you want different on your team, the things that are working or not working. And usually it's a very simple fix or a very simple you know what the fix, this finding the fix will be simple. Making it happen might be much harder, but actually finding this fix is not going to be that, that hard to do. Um, so yeah, we covered this. I would be remiss if I did not talk a little bit about bias. So I know that there's a lot of talk in the industry about like, you know, gender biases or race biases. There's a lot of bias that we talk about in the industry. I'll go to something much, much more fundamentally basic than that, something that we do at work every day. There is a problem if you have titles and people already prejudge based on the title that you have, right? If you are a project manager, you must be a magical foo with spreadsheets. I promise you I did the entire disaster recovery testing exercise, which is a thousand tests on post-its. I destroyed nature while I did it, but I did not use a spreadsheet and I suck at it. I'm really bad. Um, there is the notion that engineers can only think deep, deep and in, in go into the weeds. 
complete nonsense. I mean, have you seen some of the, the, the architectures that m most of our companies here have come up with at some point or the other? That did not come because they could only see in one dimension. They've got to see in multiple places. Or how many of you have referred to a manager as a pointy-haired boss? I mean, I know it's funny. I mean, it is. So, <laughs> so I am one too, but that's not it. But I'm saying there's so much prejudgment that's loaded into a person's title. So what I would really encourage is that we get past these simple biases and actually try to incorporate the team for the things that people bring to the team and partner with folks for the things that they are best at. So the t team and the individual thrive, the rising tide, right, basically. Um, I did have a quick note about backgrounds, and this is my personal bias, and it's a conscious bias, I get it. But very often, even in, in the teams I've built, um, people reject folks for certain reasons. For example, cannot read code in detail, or is not technical enough, or has a very whatever, like they, whatever reasons. It doesn't even matter what the reasons are. But look carefully at their backgrounds. I'm saying if you have a musician on your team, you actually have someone who can solve problems very differently than a person who's been doing engineering on the team, than a person who's been exposed to poetry, or a person, it doesn't matter. Wherever you come from, the background actually makes a huge difference in how someone can solve a problem. In my case, I would owe most of my success at Google to the fact that I ran a horrible theater group and I failed publicly so many times. We'll ignore that part and I think there's nothing on the internet anymore, thank God. But, <laughs> but basically I'm saying it taught me so much about how to actually run something in Google irrespective of my technical background. Like the fact that I did ha have like CS background doesn't matter at all. That was the, the theater background is what I use to do most of my job today. So just something to keep in mind. Like don't write off people because of something or the other. There's a flip side to everything I'm saying. You will never be able to hire anybody if I give you this set of criteria because what are you going to put on a resume? Well, I kind of do all sorts of cool stuff. Hire me. It's not going to work either. So I get there's like a huge flip side to everything that I'm saying. But since, you know, this is my talk, I just focus on the things I want to talk about. So that's all I got for you. Um, I'm, oh, before I forget, don't forget. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> You're very happy, very proud of this. So, you know, this is very important to get. But that's all I have, folks. Um, if we have time, we can, do we have time? I don't know. Yeah. I do speak quick. Dang it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you have questions, we can take it else I can. Thank you.